So my name is Wolfgang Stetzle. I'm CEO and founder of Reflect. Reflect is a Munich-based startup with about 60 employees. And we've been founded in 2012 and focus on augmented and virtual reality in, for enterprises, for large enterprises. Um, have done many, many pilot projects, prototypes, but also loads of rollouts in the meanwhile. So today I'm going to talk about um, what can you do today, what do you need to make sure to prepare for tomorrow, and what differentiates mobile platforms, mobile glasses, uh, and smart platforms, and how, how you can build on top of them. So when customers are approaching us, um, sometimes the first question is, what's the best smart glass? Um, how, which device should I buy? Sometimes, and that's no joke, companies come and say, hey, we bought 10 of, the, 10 of those devices, 10 HoloLenses, so what, can you help us doing something with them? Um, it's, it, it's happening. So it's no wonder, because there's loads of devices out there. There's the Microsoft HoloLens. There's the Google Glass. There's the Meta 2, which you've seen yesterday. There's the Dockery Smart Glasses. There's ODG, there's Epson, there's Vuzix. And then there's a company, Apple, releasing a month ago a smartphone, iPhone X, and tell the world that smartphones and tablets are going to be one of the key platforms or the key platforms over the next couple of years for augmented reality. So what? I can really understand the confusion. I can understand, especially if you're not in touch with such technologies on a day-to-day -day basis, but you've seen that they bring value and you want to jump into them. So I want to help you to understand how you can deal with it. What we typically do is we take a step back. We take a step back and say, well, there's more information required to make a solid decision for a type of device. And it usually starts with a problem. Let's analyze the problem. Let's see where do we waste money. Let's see where do we lose revenue. Where do we need to improve quality? And then check out the environment. Do we work, for example, outdoor? Do we work indoor? And that will influence the device decision because some devices use different sensors and they simply won't work outdoor. So you will then need to choose a different device. Also talking about the environment, we need to analyze what's our key user, and is that key user using the device for eight hours throughout the whole day, or just punctual from time to time? But once we've analyzed that, we can talk about the solution. And sometimes we may end up and say augmented reality may be not the best technology for, for uh, that problem and for that environment. We should define an ROI, a clear ROI target, um, and what we need to do to reach that ROI target. And then check, do we need to integrate into legacy systems? And if we choose a, a certain device, um, can't we integrate for several reasons? We need to talk about safety considerations. So if we're working on an oil and gas platform, we need to make sure that the glasses are having some kind of certifications, for example. Most of the devices don't, don't have that today. And we need to talk about plug and play. So is my technician, is my key user, I'm capable of using that device? Can I teach him? Can I train him? Do I have a sophisticated use case? Or, or does, it need to have, uh, does it need to be plug and play? And once we've done all of that, we can kind of make the decision for the device. And I can tell, um, especially German companies, they like to do, when we analyze all of that, a 100-page requirement documentation, which in the end no one reads, and uh, a lot of information gets lost. Being in Silicon Valley for three months, uh, from July to September, I can tell it's, it's, it can be done differently. It really can only be a, a, a page, a single page or a short PowerPoint presentation where we highlight the key aspects of um, such uh, bullet points on the slide. And when we've done that, we can start categorizing or digging into the categories of the, of the different devices. I've chosen the categories based on a just recently published um, yeah, study from ABI Research, and they differentiate between mobile AR, entry-level hat-worn AR, and high-end hat-worn AR or mixed reality. I know you can slice it differently. I know there's many possibilities. You could say there's monoscopic devices, there's stereoscopic devices, there's devices with different type of sensors. 
but I tried to use, or I used that category, uh, categories because I wanted to make it simple, because most of the time it comes down to that. And when we look into the different categories, then we have all the players listed on the bottom of the slide and many more. On the mobile AR side, you have Microsoft, Android, Apple with all their uh, phones and tablets and their operating systems on the entry level hardware devices. There's many companies here. You have Realware, Vuzix, Google. Um, they, most, of, most of them do monoscopic devices. Epson is also doing some uh, devices on the higher end side for proper mixed reality but they offer different solutions, different uh, um, uh, categories. And then we have the high-end devices with Microsoft, their HoloLens, the Meta 2, uh, the Avigand, which is also shown here, Dacry Glasses, uh, Magic Leap, ODG, so loads of devices. And really, now we can analyze for which use cases can they be used today. And I'm saying this um, because we've done many projects um, and uh, work with many customers on the ROI, and sometimes there's still technological challenges, so we need to look into what use cases can be made today. On the mobile AR side, um, tablets and phones, they can be perfectly used for training environments. Sometimes you don't need to have your hands free. Sometimes you need the device only for an hour, so you go to a physical object and you can interact with it to increase the knowledge retention. Beautiful use cases there. Same for education, which I don't want to talk into too much detail because it's more consumer driven. Marketing point of sale. Imagine to have your phone, your tablet, configure your car, get accessories at the point of sale and make the right purchase decision. Or remote work. Um, when you go over the trade show, you see a lot of companies um, providing or offering solutions for remote experts telemaintenance on smart glasses. But you want to make sure that you can target um, your existing devices, that you can deploy it um, for your technicians, which are already having Android or iOS or Windows devices. So you don't want to lose, lose on them until you've rolled out maybe smart glasses in the other categories. Or then location-based services where you can get additional information um, in your locations. Then entry level. Headworn AR, you might have seen the talk from Upskill yesterday. There's a company called Ubimax. They do very good stuff in picking and packing, um, in logistics on the factory floor. Also remote maintenance, remote work is very good uh, for, for such type of device. Um, getting inspections done. Um, and also repair procedures, so step-by-step -step workflows can be pretty well done on such devices. It's basically just a simple 2D visualization without spatial information in the real environment. That's what then the high-end devices provide. And you can today use a Microsoft HoloLens for a training environment. You should go to the Bosch booth, for example. They provide a multi-user um, multi experience where several trainees can work or interact on the same um, content. And that's very good for a controlled indoor environment um, to train people within an hour or two hour session. And also for education, marketing point of sale, remote um, work, such devices are pretty well, um, uh, pretty well suited today um, already. But let's take a look a little bit into the advantages and disadvantages of the devices. So mobile AR is clearly the price. It's the portability, you can take them everywhere. It's the availability in enterprises. Usually over the last years, it went through your IT department already and that's a good, pl uh, that's a good plus. It's proven and it's robust and typically such devices, they provide decent performance already. The negatives is you, don't, you cannot work hands-free. That's what, what you wanna do in an eight hour repair scenario, of course. You, have, you only have a camera see-through so you don't have the information right in front of your eyes. Auf I want to show you a use case which works with a mobile device today perfectly already. Zeigen, wo sich Bauteile befinden, die die Insassen und die Retter gefährden könnten. Mercedes-Benz stellt die Rettungskarten jetzt auch offline zur Verfügung. Dank des neuen Virtual Reality Modus werden die Karten in 3D angezeigt. Im Augmented Reality Modus sind alle sicherheitsrelevanten Bauteile direkt auf dem echten Fahrzeug zu erkennen. Die App funktioniert sowohl für Pkw als auch für Nutzfahrzeuge. 
I'm sorry for the German, there is no English version. But this application called Daimler Rescue Assist is rolled out globally in 27 languages and for the whole vehicle range of Daimler. They entirely replaced their 2D PDFs for their rescue carts with that. Working perfectly because you only need it for five minutes when you get to the um, accident as a fireman. Let's take a look at the entry level hat worn ARs. So the pros, you can work hands free. Typically they're very light, so they're also quite comfortable already. And some of them are industry ready. That's very important um, so that you can buy them in thousands to really equip all your technicians. The negatives is they don't provide spatial awareness. So they don't put the content where, where you need it to really avoid a mistake. You still need to match uh, the content with the real environment basically mentally in your head. You have a limited user experience in terms of content, in terms of interaction, and you need to make sure that you make it very simple. And it's an unnatural view because you always have to change your focus. So the focus from the real, real, real world object to the display maybe on the right top or right lower side of, of, your, of your eye. A typical use case for that is all the remote solutions or picking and packing in the logistics area. I don't have a video for that, um, but you've seen a lot of that probably already. And then jumping into the high-end worn um, augmented reality, mixed reality devices, the pros are you're also hands-free. You have a spatial awareness, um, so you really have the digital content where, where you need it. Um, and you basically can't make a mistake anymore because you can't like choose between the wrong screws, for example. In the meanwhile, you have a decent visual quality and it's very intuitive because it guides you through the real world actions. The negatives today are the headset comfort. Um, you really cannot wear them for eight hours, most of them right now. Um, they have very much higher performance requirement than the low end devices because you will need to track the real world and you need to render 3D content. And that's just draining your battery and it requires a lot of performance. And also, you, most of the devices, they deal with the problem of the focal point. So you have the display right in front of your eyes um, and you focus on the digital content, but you actually want to see the real world environment. So then you need to change the focus. If you've heard the talk yesterday from Avigant, um, light field technology is changing that um, over the next couple of months and years so that you really have basically a natural view content displayed right in the middle of your environment. I want to also show you a use case for that which is already being used by doctors. I put a slide um, in here which shows the attach rate of augmented reality by device type. It is a study from ABI Research which was published um, by at the beginning of this year. I was talking to them of whether or not it's still true. Most likely the adaption curve of smart glasses is a bit lower than on that chart. But you can see clearly there is a tipping point. Um, in this, in, on this chart between 2019 and 2020, most likely a little bit later, as I told you, um, the smart glasses at, or the attach rate for augmented reality for smart glasses will increase the attach rate for, smart, uh, for, for mobile devices. Now the question is, what do we do with that? How do we deal with that? And my recommendation is um, you jump, jump in, into augmented reality right now um, because, and I'm quoting McKinsey here, there's one significant asset that manufacturers have not yet optimized, their own data. And now if you want to 
put data on smart glasses or on uh, mixed reality devices later on, you A need to have it, you B need to have it in a very structured way or in, a, in an optimized way, and you need to look into it. So now you can start doing that in five years or you can start doing this now with use cases that already works on mobile devices like smartphones or tablets. So you're prepared for that future to have a competitive advantage. And I can tell you many companies do that already because, and I want to end with that, I'm incredibly excited by AR because I can see use cases for it everywhere. It's been said by Tim Cook, as you probably all know, Apple is investing heavily in augmented reality. They see it as the next big bang after the iPhone. So we can only expect um, to have a high adoption for augmented reality in every area. If you want to join us for that journey um, and you're looking for um, advice or you're looking for solutions, let us know. Um, we can always need customers on the one hand. On the other hand, um, technology and, and channel partners. So approach me after my talk or come to my booth. Thank you very much for your attention and have a great day, um, a great last Augmented Reality Day conference. Thank you.